Okay, and with that, I think roll call has been completed, so I'll go ahead and get started. I'm DJ Cole. I'm a technical marketing engineer at Cisco, and I'm part of our Cisco IoT group. So we do industrial networking, uh, a number of different IoT things, but it's not necessarily what you think about when you hear IoT. It's not just like sensors and things like that. It's also a lot of industrial networking. <clears throat> so with that, you're probably wondering, what does that have to do with robots, and what does that have to do with driving 192 miles per hour? Well, one of the things that we did, uh, if I can go next, maybe not. <laughs> One of the things that we did with our Cisco IoT group is we actually sponsored a, uh, a, a challenge between universities called the uh, Indie Autonomous Challenge, which essentially uh, 21 different universities started in this competition to build basically an autonomous driver for an Indy light car. Um, through, some, uh, through sort of the process, they got narrowed down to actually 10 teams that actually went out and tried their autonomous driving or their autonomous algorithms on actual physical race cars. Um, so <clears throat> if you, if you want to learn more about this, you can just kind of Google uh, Indie Autonomous Challenge. They've competed in a number of different events now. Um, the first race was over two years ago. Uh, they've been to CES. They did some things in Las Vegas. Um, <clears throat> But one of the things they actually did on the side was they went to the same, um, the same landing strip where the NASA shuttles uh, you know, from space would land in Florida in the United States. And they actually just tried on a straightaway, right, with an autonomous vehicle. How fast could they have that autonomous vehicle drive? And they actually uh, broke the autonomous land speed record for a vehicle of 192.2 miles per hour um, earlier last year. Uh, so that's kind of why we're here today. Uh, and the premise behind that is, right, like now we have autonomous vehicles, and not necessarily what you think about on the road, but autonomous robots, autonomous race cars like this, they have to be able to go that speed, right? And you have to kind of take that back to, you know, if, if you as a developer, or you're building something, right, you're not going to be building uh, robots like this. I mean, maybe you are, but maybe you're not. Um, but kind of the idea of what does it really take to communicate with a robot like that, right? You know, we live in a world where, you know, wireless isn't always reliable, and how do you build something, how do you build a robot like that or some solution like that where you can actually, you know, guarantee that the performance of that's going to be sort of the same no matter what type of network that you had. Uh, so that's kind of what this talk is about. Um, and it can kind of connect it back. But, but I'll, I'll, hopefully you learn some things along the way and it kind of prompts your interest to go like, you know, look at some of the, these things. Um, so I talked a little bit about race car. Um, and that sort of is kind of where we kind of will take kind of today's um, talk. Uh, but sort of, you know, from the Cisco side, that race car that actually went 192 miles per hour and continues to kind of you know, go 180 miles per hour on an oval track. Um, sort of what did that look like, right? You know, what is inside of a robot that's sort of that big? Um, this vehicle, and, and during the past Cisco Live, we actually had the, the car there. It was like right over there. You could actually go and look at it. But, you know, sort of some of the things in this race car, you know, this isn't just like what you would think about, you know, sort of, uh, you know, maybe a computer on board doing some stuff. Uh, but this race car actually had like a full 24 port rack mount hardened Ethernet switch in it, right? So we actually had one of our IE 5000 switches. Um, you know, half of that switch is SFPs, half of that is RJ45. Uh, and that actually connected with a 40 gig link to the onboard compute, uh, which was you know, essentially a server in this vehicle, um, to process all the images that it was getting from these um, high definition cameras, right? So as you can imagine, uh, you know, with, you kind of see here, I don't, Sorry, the screen's a little small, but you know, if you put three LiDARs on a vehicle, a bunch of radars, um, some high-definition cameras, and GNSS sensors, you can see if each one of those cameras is sending a video feed at one gigabit per second, you can easily go over what you could get on a 10 gig link, right? You know, maybe not all the way to 40, but you had to have enough room that you could actually you know, uh, push data and still be able to you know, actually communicate with the computer and things like that. So on this vehicle, we actually opted to put a 40 gig link between that compute platform and the switch. Um, and then, of course, you know, when you think about an autonomous vehicle, you kind of think, you know, if it's autonomous, that means it doesn't really have to communicate. Uh, and some people can assume that, and some people don't. Um, but when you think about it, there's a lot of stuff, even if you make the decisions on the vehicle, that you still have to know about from, uh, from sort of the, the track side, right? You know, maybe where are the other vehicles? What's happening on the track? Uh, if you take this back to a typical racing situation, you have flags, right? You have a red flag, meaning you, know, you need to stop, something happened on the track. Or maybe you know, a green flag, you can continue back from whatever the delay was. That kind of communication in an autonomous race has to happen over a wireless network, right? And that wireless network has to be reliable enough that you can send that data um, and also operate at the speeds that you would see 
in sort of an autonomous racing environment where you're going 100 mile, 180 miles per hour on a track. Um, <clears throat> so we actually put in uh, a, a technology that we have at Cisco called Cisco Ultra Reliable Wireless Backhaul. Um, that was an acquisition from a company called Fluid Mesh. Uh, we actually put uh, one of their radios in each one of these vehicles. So sort of the antennas that you see at the top, uh, that was where actually the communication to uh, radios around the track. Um, and that really allowed for that critical race control, right? Where you're sending flags to vehicles, telling the vehicle that you know, it, can, it can go, it can stop, because there's a, 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 some type of emergency on the track. Um, um, and I'll talk a little bit more, uh, kind of the other things, you know, other than race control, what that kind of entails. So that was kind of the, the, the brief like, recap to sort of set the ground for the rest of the, the presentation and sort of what you would need to do to communicate uh, effectively when you're communicating with something over a robot, or sorry, with a robot so over, over wireless. Um, but first off, sort of to start this with, if you're going 192 miles per hour, how far do you think that you go in one second at 192 miles per hour? Just any guess from anyone out there? This is the interactive part where no one wants to say. You actually go, in, in 10 milliseconds, you're actually going 2.83 feet, right? Which, sorry, I didn't do the conversions to meters there, right? But that's a, a little over, a little about like probably two thirds of a meter. Um, and in one second, you can go 283 feet. Um, and it kind of shows you how much processing, how fast that processing has to be to really identify things on the track, right? Because if you're imagining that you're getting data from cameras, data from LIDAR, uh, data from radar on the vehicle, and every time that you basically have to compute that and process that, if you're processing it at every 10 milliseconds, that vehicle's already went 2.83 feet by the time it has to make any sort of um, decision on when it needs to stop. So imagine if you're you know, you're building one of these race cars, and you're, you're supervising this on the track, and you see something that goes wrong. Imagine if you have a button on the table, right? And you say, if you push this button, that car has to stop on the track. You know, you have the reaction time of you being able to see something happen. You push that button, the wireless communication to the vehicle. Um, that quickly can be, you know, 250 milliseconds. Think in 250 milliseconds how far that car has went. That's 100 feet. Plus, this car actually still has to physically stop, right? When you think about a vehicle going that fast and braking that fast, you actually have the, well, not only the response time of the control system, but also the response time of the vehicle stopping, um, which can be really fast, kind of the point. Um, so in the first iteration of the Indy Autonomous Challenge, it actually happened at Indy Motor Speedway in Indianapolis, Indiana, in the United States. And uh, to kind of deploy the wireless around this, we actually had to go out and deploy 11 uh, base stations all the way around the track, right? These were all backhauled via fiber, and we just had the wireless communication between the car and the track. But you know, at that speed that we just talked about, and going two and a half miles around this track, that essentially means you have to do a lot of these handoffs, right? So in a traditional wireless network, we call it roaming. In our, uh, in our uh, curb technology, our Cisco Ultra Reliable Wireless Backhaul technology, we call that handoff, right? It's a little bit different. Um, if you want to sort of know more about that, feel free to go Google that. Or uh, over in the um, IoT section of the World of Solutions, we have that technology on, on display. But it's not really sort of what we're here for today. But um, it's kind of the interesting fact how we use the IoT technology to be able to do that. Um, <clears throat> now, over that network, right? And this is kind of where this, 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 this um, lightning session is sort of going in terms of purpose. But, there's different ways that you can decide when you're building a robot how you want to communicate, right? And how you communicate, how you structure that communication is really critical to how that robot's going to operate once you put it on wireless, right? You know, if you're developing a robot and you're developing a control system either in a simulation or on a wired network, you're not going to have the performance that you have. You know, you're going to have different performance when you take that robot and you put it on wireless. Um, and there's different types of traffic that you can send between your robot and maybe your control system, right? So say you go out there and develop this robot, and you develop a control system, right? Because what is a robot without a control system? You know, you could develop a robot that's completely autonomous, but usually there's triggers or there's some other information that you want to send to your robot for things around you, right? In the instance of the Indie Autonomous Challenge, you know, what is the other information? Um, 
you know, during an actual race, you have the things like I talked about, like the flags, right? You may have information on you know, external weather, right? Because while these cars have lots of sensors on them, they don't necessarily know things like the temperature of the track, you know, maybe if there's any wind speed, things like that, that you may want to send. Those would be things in an actual race, right, that the driver would, would, would learn over the radio, right? You tell the driver, here's the wind speed, you know, they'd already know the temperature of the track, things like that. Um, and then you have other messages, right? Just kind of procedural messages that you want to tell the, the, the vehicle or you want to tell your robot. Um, and then you have all this, these, these other things, right? Logging messages and things like that. Um, so something kind of, the way I look at this is, if you're building a robot, right? And it doesn't necessarily have to be an autonomous re ve uh, race vehicle, but it can be any type of robot. Um, there's certain data that you want to send to that robot, and there's certain ways that work better in how we structure, you know, sort of um, bringing that data to the robot in a way that is reliable. And, and, and usually this, this is kind of, counterintuitive to what a lot of people think about when they think about how do we send this data, right? And I classify it as three different types of traffic. Deterministic data is something where you're basically sending the same data every time you send a packet, right? So if you're sending things like, um, like wind speed or track temperature, imagine a race car, but these could also be things about locations of different uh, things around the robot. You know, if you're in a factory, this could be like e-stop status, right? If you have all these buttons around the factory floor and you need to know if an e-stop's pressed, this would be something along the lines of, are any of the e-stop buttons pressed, right? If any of them are pressed, it sends a one. If any of them are not pressed, it sends a zero. Um, typically, that actually be the opposite way, right? Um, if none of them are pressed, it's going to keep sending you a one, and then it goes to zero when one of them's pressed saying, you need to stop. Um, but the idea behind that deterministic control is that every packet that you send, it contains all the data that you need, right? So every time you send that packet, and I'll get to that in just a second, like sort of what that looks like, every time you do that, every one of those packets has that same data in it. Non-deterministic is a little bit different, and it's used for a different purpose. Um, it can be used for a different purpose, depending on how you decide to program your robot. Um, but really, the idea there is that you're sending variable changes sort of as they happen, but you don't send it every packet, right? So when something like, um, you know, the speed that you want your vehicle to go changes, you would just send basically a message saying, speed is now seven, right? And it processes that and it moves on. Um, and then you have the non-control traffic, right? Things like log messages, things that are, don't really fit in any of those other categories. Um, when you're sending that deterministic data, and this is something that I think happens a lot in industry and you don't really realize it, is every one of those packets is being sent at a certain interval, right? So if you're sending things like um, the, you know, the, 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 the wind speed, you're going to send that every 10 milliseconds with the same value. And what happens is if you lose one of those packets, right, uh, say to interference or something on the wireless, the next packet is always going to have the updated information, right? So you don't have to wait for that information. Um, and I have a story about this uh, I'll, I'll share with you. Um, when we were actually doing the Indy Autonomous Challenge, they were sort of sending all data as, as what we would call non-deterministic, right? So things like vehicle steering, speed, uh, basically any of that data would be sent non-deterministic, right? But imagine if you have some interference and you're sending all these data as just updates, right? What happens when one of them gets lost? You know, because you're sending this data and it has to be reliable in the sense that you can't drop it, you know, a, a lot of the implementations of sort of the underlying um, abstraction layer when you're sending these messages, um, use TCP, right? So imagine one of these gets lost and you have to start retransmitting packets. They're going to start buffering uh, kind of behind, right? Imagine you're steering the vehicle though, right? Imagine you have a joystick and you're, you're, you're controlling via the joystick where the vehicle is steering. Well, what happens if you know, you're looking at the vehicle because you're, you're doing something called tele-remote operation, and I'm going to talk about that in a second. Um, but you know, what happens if the vehicle is not really, uh, not really doing what you're telling it to do? You know, you're telling it to turn left. It's not turning left because all of a sudden this, this communication got buffered. And you just keep pushing it more to the left, right? Because it's not going. It's just like you're driving your car and it's not going. Well, what happens if all of a sudden your, your communication improves and all those packets go through, and all of a sudden your car goes whoop and hits a wall? Well, guess what? That happened, right? So sort of the, the message here is, you know, <clears throat> if you're building a robot and you're doing things like that, kind of determine what's the best way to share that information. Um, and I have sort of a demo at the end here. Uh, but 
the vehicle, this, this robot actually runs on something called uh, Robot Operating System 2, or also known as ROS2, right? It's a very kind of common hardware platform of robot kind of operating system for different hardware. And uh, the, the basic implementation of that is basically treating everything as non-deterministic control type traffic, right? You make a change, it sends it over a message, it's all TCP. It looks like what I'm going to show you in the next slide. Um, but that's not always necessarily something that you want to do, right? So if you were developing a robot and you wanted some control system like that, you would basically have to implement something on top of it that looked like this deterministic control, right? Where you're sending that data every x interval, and if for some reason one were to drop, you send another packet with all that information 10 milliseconds later, right? So if you were to drop something, you don't have to wait for that message. There's no buffering. Uh, nothing like that happens. Um, this is kind of an example. This is actually a true example from the Indie Autonomous Challenge of what it looks like to have sort of that non-deterministic control, right? You know, you don't have to read all of this, but you know, basically you can see that every time you send one of these values, you send the full variable saying, you know, the, the, the joystick or is, is this, the emergency joystick is off. You know, imagine if you're trying to send that from your program to a robot, you know, and, and one of those gets stuck, you have to wait for the rest of those messages to get through, and they all have to be processed in the kind of the order that you sent them for them to be interpreted. Um, versus if you were sending that, you know, just small bits of data every 10 milliseconds um, with that same information, you know what's going to be in every packet. You don't have to sit there and kind of process the actual variables that are in it. You know how to read those. And if one of those packets gets dropped or that gets delayed, you can just discard it and, and use the next one, right? Because every packet had uh, the relevant copy of what you needed to know in it. Um, something else that kind of is, is very interesting, and this is sort of a side topic, but is when you have these different types of data, um, you can actually queue it, right? So you know, imagine these are your typical wireless queues, and you may or may not be kind of have a wireless background, um, especially if you're in development, maybe you don't. Um, but you basically have four basic queues in most wireless networks. Um, VO or voice, video, uh, best effort, and sort of the background, but typically the background isn't used. And you can actually prioritize what data goes out first, right? So imagine in your deterministic traffic, things like, you know, what is the e-stop status of the vehicle? What speed should I be going? Uh, all these different things. You can actually have that prioritized to make sure that goes out. It's the most critical data. It's not, there is no delay to that data getting to your vehicle. Um, and sort of what a lot of people don't realize is, is this is not necessarily as important as this, and if, for some reason, this doesn't get actually sent out you know, over the wireless network or over your Ethernet network. You can actually just drop this, right? Because the next packet, 10 milliseconds later, will have the same data in it. And having old copies of this data waiting around in a queue buffer is not really something that you want anyway. You can just drop that. Then you want you know, that non-deterministic data, which hopefully, in sort of your implementation of your coding, is something that is a little less critical time-wise. You can buffer that, send that next. But you also want to make sure you know, if this data you know, is, couldn't go out for some reason, there was interference, you want to retransmit this more times and try to have it go through. Because you need all these variables because your, your application may not be smart enough to send this again if it didn't go through the first time, right? And then you want to have those updates. Uh, and then, of course, all those log messages, you know, don't forget the survey type things. Um, those can sort of be at the end, because they're not as critical. If you drop this, it's not necessarily going to have a negative effect you know, on your uh, on the operation of your robot. Um, that's kind of, kind of in a nutshell, uh, something, some things to think about if you were programming a robot, right? And now, sort of the next part of this, and then I have a demo, is you know, imagine that you're building a robot, right? Imagine that you're building an autonomous vehicle. Um, there's a few different ways that you're actually going to use that autonomous vehicle, right? We talked about racing on a racetrack. And in that sense, your autonomous vehicle is basically kind of standalone, right? If you tell this autonomous vehicle to go out and do a race, everything that you've told that vehicle to do is pre-programmed, right? You basically tell it, you know, here, go race. Maybe here's the maximum speed you can go. But it's going to control itself all the way around that track. And in that sense, you know, you really only need a, a little bit of communication because you're just telling it the basic things to do. It's making all the decisions. Um, but that's not necessarily the only thing that you need to do to develop a robot, right? It's not always going to be autonomous when you're doing your development. The next thing is, you know, imagine, imagine you need to control this robot remotely when you're doing that development, right? What happens if your software has an issue and this, this vehicle gets stuck in the middle of the track? You know, there's two options there, right? Um, and depending on 
the robot. One of them may or may not be better than the other. Um, you can either take a tow truck and go tow that vehicle back <laughs> to, your, to where you're doing it, or you can sit there and remotely operate that vehicle and drive it back. And that's sort of what, in the robot world, you call tele-remote operation, or you know, you're basically sending direct commands to the vehicle to kind of move itself. Um, but you have to kind of support both of those because the development process isn't just you know building a robot and sort of going out there and doing it autonomously, right? That's sort of like you know compiling the code and seeing if there are errors or not. It doesn't really work when you're doing a robot because if it's an autonomous vehicle going 180 miles per hour, you know that bug you hit is a wall, and you can't just recompile again. You have to go and replace parts on the vehicle. Um, so you kind of have to kind of balance those out, right? So imagine that tomorrow you go out and decide to build your robot. You sort of have to make the decision in that framework at the beginning and saying, you know, how do I want to structure my communication? How do I want to structure that communication to be effective over top of you know, maybe a wireless network, right? Because very few robots today are built with a cable attaching them, right? Especially outside of a development world. And if you want to go 192 miles per hour, your Wi-Fi network is not going to cut it to connect your robot. Um, so that's, that's kind of some things to think about. Um, and then I actually had a, a demo sort of integrated with this presentation, but the robot that I wanted to bring, I could not bring to Europe. So uh, with that, I sort of have the next best thing of basically a camera watching my robot. Um, some people have cameras on their pets. I have a camera at home on my robot, right? Um, <clears throat> and I think what is most interesting here is that this robot, I talked about Ross to the, 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 the kind of the platform, the software platform that runs that robot race car that went 192 miles per hour. This, essentially vacuum cleaner, Roomba, um, runs the same ROS2 operating system, right? Obviously, they put more code on top of it to run a race car, more sensors, and things like that. Um, but essentially, you can do sort of that same testing and development with just, you know, basically, this is an off-the-shelf educational robot, right? Um, although this one has a Cisco uh, wireless radio on top of it to do a little bit more, um, you can basically do the same thing, right? So I can essentially tell my robot to undock and now think about it, I just sent that command. This robot is about 6,400 kilometers away, and you have that latency between my keyboard and the actual robot, right? I hit the button, it takes a little while to do that. Imagine that same thing is happening you know, locally to a race car or to some other robot over your wireless network. You know, I'm just sending it commands and it's knowing what to do, but you're gonna see here in a second what it looks like if I'm actually trying to like, tell a remote operation and, and what, that, what that's gonna do, right? So, I can tell the robot to come see us and get a little closer to the uh, camera. It's going to drive over there. Um, and uh, all this is basically just commands, right? Go to a certain spot. It's a very short command. You know, there isn't a lot of latency involved there. Um, but if I go into actual tele remote operation and drive this robot around, you're going to start to see that I'm actually going to tell you. So, you know, I'm pushing a button now. And not only do you have the delay of the robot, you also have the delay of the camera and all those other things. Um, so you can quickly see, like, you know, if this was something that was happening, and you're using this sort of non-deterministic non communication, right? So I guess I should preface that, you know, the basic kind of ROS2 implementation of this is all sort of non-deterministic. It's actually sending values like, move this far, do this. It's sending that every time. It's not telling you know the robot what those actual speeds are I'm inputting. Um, every 10 milliseconds, you know, there's a little bit of latency involved with that. Um, and and that, that can sort of be the problem, right? So if you were to go out and build one of these tomorrow, and you wanted to go 100 miles per hour, or 180 miles per hour on a track, you sort of have to do a little, something a little different. Um, not only in the actual wireless you know, communication network, right? Because at that point, Wi-Fi is, you're, you're sort of pushing the limitation of Wi-Fi in terms of roaming at that speed. Um, but you're also pushing sort of the communication protocol, right? Um, you know, just sending these, sending these non-deterministic messages, non-deterministic messages, sorry, um, and I'm going off screen, uh, is just very difficult to control this robot. You know, I, I am struggling at this point, not only with my computer, but also uh, to con put the robot where I want it. Um, it's very difficult to try to drive when you have that latency and you're trying to send those messages. Um, if you were putting this in a deterministic packet and sending it every 10 milliseconds, it's going to perform better, not only just because of the internet, but also because of that wireless communication to the robot. Because you know, if, if one of those were to, to get dropped, it's not going to be a big deal because it knows what it's doing. So I am just going to tell this robot to go home because uh, with, the, with the latency, it, it's, it's not going to work otherwise. Uh, let's see. There we go. 
sorry, move that off to the side. I can tell the robot to go home, and it basically drives itself back home. So, oh, maybe it's not going to. Sometimes it gets a little stuck, but this is this is part of the development process. Um, so imagine, you know, with this thinking about how the different ways that you can communicate with your robot. Maybe you go out there and decide to actually program a robot. It's much easier than I think you would you you would think. Um, a lot of the interfaces to this this ROS2 operating system are all Python. So if you know Python, you basically can go out and kind of build a little bit more than just sending the commands on the command line. Um, but you sort of have to think, right? You know, maybe the built-in sort of underlying layer that ROS2 gives me isn't enough if I want to do this over a, a little bit less uh, reliable wireless network or at a faster speed, and I want to program my own. You know, maybe this gives you something to think about how you would do that. Um, with that, go back to the presentation. Um, <clears throat> just some follow-up housekeeping slides. Um, you know, with the DevNet Zone, uh, if you're interested in API insights, uh, with Cisco, we, we do a lot with developers. Um, you can scan this or go to uh, cs.co slash API to learn more about that. Um, we also have the DevNet webinar series that you can uh, sign up for. Uh, if you're fast enough to pull out your phone and scan that by the time I'm done with the slide, then you can go there. Um, I'm not going to expect you to remember that. If you really want the URL, come up afterwards. Um, with that, DevNet also wants your feedback. Uh, if you scan this or go to cs.co slash dnz for uh, DevNet Zone slash Cisco CL Europe 2023, um, or scan the barcode. Uh, you can fill out a survey and be entered to win a, a DevNet hoodie. Um, and with that, that's the kind of the conclusion of my short talk. If you have any questions, uh, I know it's kind of hard to like fit all this into 20, 20 minutes and sort of make it uh, worth it. Uh, you know, feel free to come up and ask questions at the end. With that, thank you.